whenever there's so-called good news in crypto, there's always a pump that is immediately followed by a dump. And that's exactly what happened. I think Ripple dropped about 25%. They took the rest of the crypto market down with it. In today's video, Peter Schiff, founder, CEO and global strategist of Euro-Pacific Capital, gives a warning that the 2008 crisis was just the prelude to a larger sovereign debt crisis in the United States that may lead to a collapse of the US dollar. This is all counterintuitive, ironic, that the dollar losing less purchasing power than anticipated means that the dollar loses uh, its purchasing power on international markets. So you would think it'd be the opposite. Uh, but I've explained for many reasons why this is the case. But the PPI was supposed to come out at plus 0.2 for June, and instead it came out at plus 0.1, so better than expected. There was an even bigger improvement in the year-over-year -year increase, which was supposed to be 0.5, and that was a lot lower than the 1.1 from the prior uh, a month, year-over-year. -year. That was revised down to up 0.9. And the June number came out at just 0.1, so barely positive. And even when you strip out the food and e energy, the monthly increase was just 0.1 compared to 0.2 estimates. And the year over year was supposed to be 2.8, which would have matched the prior month. And instead it came down to 2.4. So more uh, better than expected data on prices, uh, weighing on the dollar on Thursday and then again on Friday. So the dollar index actually dropped by 2.3% on the week. That may sound not sound like a lot, but when it comes to foreign exchange for a currency like the dollar, that is a big move. Significantly, the dollar index closed below 100. We haven't been at this level since May of 2022. So that's pretty significant. Also, I think psychologically, getting below 100 could be significant. You know, the US dollar rallied starting in January of 2021. That was kind of the, the low of the dollar. And we rallied from January of 2021 all the way through to September of 2022. That rally was almost 30%, maybe 29%. That is a huge rally. Now, since that peak, the dollar index is now down about 13%. It's still up a lot, but not nearly as much as it was. But what's significant about this is the main reason that the inflation numbers have come down as much as they have. I mean, even though we haven't come anywhere close to 2% on a year over year basis, we're a lot lower than we were, thanks in large part to the strength of the dollar that acted as a tightening all by itself. Yes, you had the Fed raising rates, you had the Fed shrinking its balance sheet, but you also had the dollar going up. That helped the Fed. That was a tightening in and of itself. Monetary conditions tighten when the dollar goes up. And so that helped bring down prices. Think about it from this perspective, commodity prices are priced in dollars, at least for now. That's how they're quoted. That's how they're traded by and large. And so if the dollar goes up by 30%, those prices go up by 30% for every other country. And so that really results in a reduction in demand because of that huge increase in price that brings down the price and that benefits the U.S. because we have dollars. We create dollars. So we don't see a price increase in commodities when the dollar goes up. We actually get a benefit because more of our international uh, competitors who are bidding for those same resources get priced out. Their demand goes down because they're looking at these higher prices. And so then we get the benefit of lower prices. So the dollar, the foreign exchange market was doing a lot of the Fed's work. It was tightening without the Fed having to hike rates more. And a lot of the strength in the dollar was a byproduct of just rhetoric. The Fed being very tough, all that tough talk about how they were going to keep on fighting and doing whatever it takes to bring down inflation. That got 
you know, factored into the dollar. In fact, the dollar started to rally even before the Fed started hiking. It was because the Fed started to indicate that it was going to hike. The foreign currency markets got in front of that and started to discount those rate hikes and that tighter policy, and the dollar started going up. Well, the dollar is now falling because the foreign currency markets are again forward looking. They know that the Fed is either done hiking or close enough to the peak that the next significant move that the markets are looking for is an ease and that's being priced in. But the fact that the dollar is already falling again, that counts as an ease. So even if the Fed continues to hike, if the dollar keeps falling, that effect will be larger than the rate hikes. And so even though the Fed would be hiking rates, the weakness in the dollar will actually be negating those hikes and will have the effect of a cut because it will be loosening of monetary conditions. And as I've been saying, the weakness in the dollar is going to result in strength in commodity prices. Oil prices closed at about $75.20 on, on the week. We were actually down on Friday, but we've been gathering a lot of momentum. Other commodities, silver in particular, has been particularly strong, not just because gold was strong, but silver is also an industrial metal, a commodity in that respect. And it is um, also moving with, uh, with the dollar. In addition to the dollar selling off on the week, the bond market rose a bit and yields came down on the back of the better than expected inflation numbers. But again, anybody looking at these numbers is looking in the rear view mirror. They need to look forward at the weakness of the dollar and the impact that's going to have on prices, import prices, energy prices, everything, and how that's going to affect future CPI increases. The markets, again, haven't figured this out. I think if you look at where the dollar is right now, <clears throat> we could fall very quickly from where we are down to about 90. And that's a 10% drop. That still wouldn't erase 100% of the dollar's rise since January of 2021, but it would erase most of it. Uh, and I think that's going to be an initial support area for the dollar. And I probably think that the markets won't be particularly concerned about the dollar as long as we're above that 90 level. But I think once we crack it, uh, you're going to see uh, some type of panic setting in in the bond market or in the foreign exchange market. And if it doesn't happen at 90, there will be a breaking point somewhere along the way. Remember, the record low for the dollar was just above 70 back in 2008 before it was saved, ironically, by the financial crisis. The next crisis is really a currency crisis, U.S. dollar crisis. I don't know if it's going to take a break to all time record lows to precipitate that crisis. But if that's what it's going to take, that's what it's going to happen because the dollar is going to take out that low. Either that's going to happen and cause the crisis or that's going to happen as a result of the crisis. But one way or another, we're getting the crisis. Now, the gold market should smell that out well in advance. And I think gold will start hitting new highs before the dollar hits new lows. In fact, long before the dollar hits new lows. In fact, looking at what happened with the gold stocks this week, very significant gains. The GDX was up 8.7% on the week. And the juniors, the GDXJ was up 9.5%. So as I was saying on my last couple of podcasts, these stocks have really been beaten down. Uh, and even with this rally, they're still a good buy. I mean, they were a better buy on the last couple of podcasts when I pointed out how cheap they were. Well, they're a little less cheap now, but they're, it's still not too late by any chance, uh, you know, to buy these things. I mean, it's still really, really early. Now, of course, the gold stocks weren't the only stocks that were up on the week. Pretty much everything was up on the week. Uh, the NASDAQ, NASDAQ 100 hit new highs, uh, not record highs, but new 52-week highs on Friday. Interestingly enough, the NASDAQ 
uh, and the S&P closed negative on Friday. Now, I don't know that this was a big enough reversal to constitute, you know, an end of this. You know, NVIDIA hit a new high uh, on the day, a new record high for NVIDIA. It also closed down about a percent on, on Friday. But again, it's too small a decline uh, to say it constitutes some kind of significant reversal. We just have to keep our eye on it. Eventually, there is going to be a reversal. You know, the ARK Innovation ETF was up 11% on the week, even though it fell 2% on, on Friday. So there was some profit taking on Friday in these tech stocks, even though, uh, let's say the Dow was up 2.3% on the week. It was also up on Friday. I think it was the only of the major indexes to be up on Friday. Russell 2000 also down on Friday, but still up 3.6% on the week. The biggest loser though on Friday was Bitcoin. Uh, the GBTC Bitcoin Trust still eked out a 0.3% gain on the week, but all of its weekly gains or most of them were wiped out by a 7.6% plunge on Friday. In fact, there was a lot of volatility in Bitcoin Thursday and Friday because you got a court ruling that Ripple was not a security, which is a good ruling. Uh, and that good news sent Ripple soaring and you know it took the rest of the crypto market with it bitcoin got back above 31,000 but of course whenever there's so-called good news in crypto there's always a pump that is immediately followed by a dump and that's exactly what happened i think ripple dropped about 25 percent on friday took the rest of the crypto market down with it Bitcoin, which had gotten above 31,000, sold off to below 30,000. I mean, it's back above that level now as I'm doing this podcast, but we had all of that volatility. You know, there's been other news, of course, that has been driving uh, Bitcoin. One is the prospects of an ETF, a Bitcoin ETF uh, that is going to be brought out by Blackstone. And I was listening to the CEO, um, uh, a Larry Fink, who was on CNBC doing an interview, and he's turned into a typical Bitcoin shill. You know, this is the same type of conversion that guys like Kevin O'Leary made with FTX, because Larry Fink used to be a critic of Bitcoin. But now that he thinks he can make some money off of Bitcoin, all of a sudden he's a big pumper. And so he was on this interview on CNBC <clears throat> saying some absurd things. So, first of all, he said that gold, that the cost of trading physical gold was absurd or buying gold. He didn't say trading, buying. He said the cost to buy physical gold is absurd. And so he was trying to say that ETFs uh, democratized gold and made it so the average guy could buy gold because it was just prohibitively expensive to buy physical gold, which is complete nonsense. I was selling physical gold, you know, before that ETF came into existence. And the cost to buy gold is not absurd. It's one or 2%. I mean, if you buy from a reputable dealer like Shift Gold, that's all it costs. That's not high. And then you can store it yourself. It costs you nothing. Gold has already been democratized. It didn't need the ETF. What the ETF did was made it easier, let's say, to buy it in an IRA, or it made it easier to trade gold. Yes, if you want to day trade gold, Yes, the cost of day trading one ounce maple leaves. Yes, that would be uh, prohibitive. That would be absurd. But I was never selling gold coins to day traders, selling gold coins to people that want to hold on to them for a long period of time. In that case, it's cheaper than the ETF because the ETF has a storage fee that you have to pay. So if you're holding on to an ETF for 10 years, that's a lot more expensive than holding on to your own uh, you know, gold maple leaves. But so what Larry Fink was really talking about was that the ETF made it easier to day trade gold, not own gold. But now he's trying to say the same BS for Bitcoin. This is the irony of it. He was talking crypto, 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 not so much Bitcoin. But he said that this ETF was going to do for Bitcoin what the gold ETF did for gold, because he said the cost of trading Bitcoin on your own is absurd. It's so expensive and so cumbersome to actually buy crypto that 
they're doing everybody a favor by creating this ETF that now lets everybody buy crypto who couldn't buy it before, which is nonsense. The whole value proposition for Bitcoin or other crypto is that it eliminates the need for a third party. It eliminates the precise ETF that Larry Fink is creating that he thinks adds value to Bitcoin. If he's going to argue that Bitcoin is too expensive and too cumbersome to actually trade, and therefore you need an ETF, he's just undermined the main value proposition of Bitcoin itself. And so if Bitcoin doesn't have any value until you put it into an ETF, then what exactly are you putting into that ETF that has value? You're putting nothing. The whole argument is, is absurd because it contradicts itself. You know, this ETF is going to have a custody fee. There is no custody fee to store your own Bitcoin. So why the hell do you need to pay Blackstone money to store something that you could just as easily store yourself from free, for free? Look, he does not believe in Bitcoin or crypto or anything else. He's motivated by a desire to make some money off this ETF. And that's the reason he's flipped. Just like Kevin O'Leary got paid by Bankman Freed a bunch of money to go out and pump FTX, even though he didn't even believe in it. That's what's going on with Larry Fink. This guy is laughing all the way to the bank. He's out there pumping up something that he has no interest in owning himself. He doesn't believe in. He's just trying to make a buck. This is what Wall Street does. This is the history of, of Wall Street. You know, they're, they they care about themselves, right? That's their, their, their main uh, mission. And they've been protected by the SEC. They've been protected by, uh, by, by FINRA. You know, people think, oh, you know, these guys are all government regulated, so they must be, you know, they must be okay. You know, there's a watchdog there to, to make sure they don't rip me off. No, you, you got to be your own watchdog. The government is not going to help you.